the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we start to enter the end of the church here, the church on earth starts turning her mind toward the end things. We start to give more thought to the return of our Lord and what that will mean for this old created order and for the world to come. Our readings begin to shed light on what to expect in those times. And so, before us this morning, we have the parable of the ten virgins. In it, Jesus describes ten virgins, all belonging to a wedding party, who are waiting for the bridegroom to arrive so that the festivities can begin. While they're waiting, night falls, and they each fall asleep. At midnight, they're awakened by the announcement that the bridegroom has arrived, and so they quickly trim the wicks of their lamps. But five of the virgins were foolish. They didn't bring enough oil to keep the lamps burning through the night. They try to borrow some from the wise virgins, but it's made clear that if it's split up, then none of them will have any light. So they're told to rush out to the dealers and buy someone who will sell them lamp oil at this late hour. While they're away, the bridegroom arrives and the remaining wedding party, the five wise virgins, are whisked away into the hall and the door is shut. The foolish virgins are stuck outside the hall, outside the feast, with the bridegroom saying those chilling words, I do not know you. Now, many people have tried to interpret this parable. Some people say that it's about how you should be doing good things all the time just in case Jesus comes back. That way, he'll catch you doing something good, and he'll be happy with you, as if Jesus is some sort of negligent parent who leaves the room all the time and comes back and will be surprised that you're doing something nice. Others talk about the reverse of this, saying that it's about how you shouldn't sin because you don't want Jesus to come back and to catch you doing something bad, as if he wouldn't find out anyway. Others still try to put an allegorical spin on the parable, saying that it's about how you have to have enough oil, which represents faith or hope, to keep your metaphorical lamp burning all the way until Jesus returns. Now, we could go on and on with all of these, but they all have one thing in common. All of these interpretations are about you what you must do or not do, how God only reacts to the actions that you're doing. In all of these interpretations, you have the lead. In all of these mistaken understandings of this parable, it's chiefly about you. But we know that when it comes to the faith, it isn't about us. It isn't about what we do or don't do. God isn't sitting in heaven waiting for us to make the first move. He didn't wait for creation to ask to be made before he made it. He didn't wait until everyone was ready before he sent his son to redeem the world, and he certainly didn't wait until we asked before he sent the Holy Spirit to create faith in us. No, this parable isn't about you. It's about Jesus. It's about what God does. And thus, when we finally get the spotlight off of ourselves and back onto our Savior, it's then that we get to the heart of this parable. The point is that the bridegroom is coming. And because he is coming, because the action is his, we watch. The bridegroom is coming, so watch. Jesus is returning, so watch and be ready. In our parable, the wise virgins were ready. 
the foolish ones weren't. We need a little bit of context to really understand this. And so we need to understand that at the time when Jesus told this parable, wedding feasts were enormous. They weren't the one evening receptions that we're used to. No, they were multi-day extravaganzas. It took a lot of planning and preparing. And sometimes the groom would have to come from quite a distance away. And because they weren't slaves to their clocks and watches like we are, the party started when everything was ready and everyone was there. The bridegroom would wait for everything to be prepared, and then he would begin his trip to go to his bride. Now, because they could be traveling from a long way off, that just meant that they showed up when they showed up. Sometimes in the evening, sometimes after sunset, sometimes they would stay somewhere overnight and then arrive in the morning, and sometimes, as in our parable, they would arrive at midnight. Now, the wise virgins knew this, and so they were ready to watch. They brought enough oil to have light to keep a vigil for the bridegroom for the entire night. They knew that as the wedding party, they were to be ready at any given moment. And so the wise virgins knew that the bridegroom could delay or that he could arrive at any time, hence the extra oil for their lamps. But the foolish virgins didn't even take this into account. It hadn't even crossed their minds. Now this is much in the same way that many Christians today don't even think about Christ's return as something to be ready for. After all, think about how you spend your time. How little thought is given to the fact that this world and all of its busyness, all the things that it says are important, is quickly passing, and that the bridegroom could arrive at any moment. Are you ready for that? How much thought have you given it in the last week, or even the last month? The bridegroom is coming. So watch and be ready. Do not be lulled by the things of this dying world into thinking that things will continue on forever as they always have. The bridegroom is already on his way. Now that's not to say that all preparations for the bridegroom's arrival have necessarily been good. There have been many who have watched and waited and tried to prepare, but they wanted to do so on their own terms. We need only look at the countless failed predictions about Jesus' return or the end of the world to know that it's part of human nature to expect God to operate by our timing or according to our reason. 500 A.D., 1000 A.D., 1524, 1836, 1874, 1914, 2000, 2011, and 2015 are but a few dates that have been predicted for Jesus' return, but which has slipped by without the bridegroom's arrival. But, lest we simply stand laughing at others for things of which we are also guilty, let's take an honest look at ourselves. Now, you might not be predicting the return of Christ according to some complicated mathematical formula or a misreading of a few Bible passages, but you're expecting him to arrive by your schedule, too. You want him to delay further until you get all of those things done that you really want to do. Go on that dream vacation. See your grandchild's wedding. Get that better house. This is just the opposite side of the same coin. 
Rather than trying to hurry Jesus' return by choosing a date on the calendar that's coming up, instead, you're trying to push his return further away so that you can enjoy what this world has to offer. You're drowsing, thinking that you can buy oil later, that there's no way that the bridegroom would show up before you've finished your bucket list. And in so doing, you've revealed your idols, those things that you would rather have than eternally being in the presence of the God who promises you so much more. You choose these things over him all the time, intentionally or not. And so, you spurn the bridegroom. And thus, now at the end of the church year, when we stand on the threshold of the end of all things, we're led to repent. Repent of turning these things into idols. Repent of demanding that God bend His schedule to meet yours. Realize that what He's bringing with Him is so much better than what we could ever imagine. You see, to long for the return of the bridegroom doesn't mean that you're despising or looking down on the gifts that He's given you in this world. No, to hold to the return of Christ as the highest good and that all other goods must be second place to it, that's just simply getting life, your life in this world and the next, in the proper order. The bridegroom is coming, so watch and anticipate the wedding feast. The Lord is returning. We have his word on that. Now, he may seem to delay, and there might even be moments when we wonder if he is coming back at all, but he is. He hasn't told us exactly when. He's just told us to watch. He wants you to watch. He wants you to keep your eyes open for him because he doesn't want you to miss out on all that he's prepared for you. And that's why he forgives you of all of those times that you've placed something else as more important than him. That's why just this morning at the beginning of the service, he forgave you for all of the times during the week when you forgot that he was on his way back and you fell asleep without any extra oil. That's why he will, in a few moments, spread a foretaste of that wedding feast here at his altar. A meal that will forgive you and point you forward to the feast that's yet to come. He forgives you and he refocuses your mind because at midnight the cry will go up, the bridegroom is here, come out to meet him. And we will. If you should fall asleep in the Lord before that time, you will come out to meet him. You'll come out of your grave, resurrected and restored to perfection. And if you haven't, well, then the scene will be that which St. Paul described in the epistle reading this morning. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. You will be ushered into the wedding hall where the saints and martyrs are gathered waiting for the feast to begin. You'll be seated with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with prophets and apostles, with all who have watched and waited in the faith. The Lord will prepare a a feast of rich food, of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of 
aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up the covering of death that is cast over all people. He will swallow up death forever. In that wedding hall to which you will be summoned, the bridegroom will wipe away all tears from your face so that you will always be with the Lord. Watch, therefore. This is not a feast that you want to miss out on. This is the wedding feast of the Lamb in His kingdom that has no end. In the name of Jesus, the Bridegroom who is returning. Amen.